Today, um, I have a sermon in my Bible, and I'm, I'm raring to go. But the way the service has turned, I don't know how much of it I'm going to get to preach. I'm going to do something this morning. This is the fourth anniversary of the Brownsville Revival, and we haven't done this on the third anniversary or the second or, or any of them on the first. But this week has felt like to me, I guess maybe I'm a little bit sensitive, but to me this week has felt like we just sort of topped a hill somehow. I don't know what it is about it, but it feels like we sort of topped a hill. And um, it seems like that there's a special grace on today. It feels like there's a special something that God is doing in the, in the Brownsville Revival and the Brownsville Assembly of God. I can't explain it, but it just feels different this year. This week, I was at, um, at home and I was meditating and thinking on the things of the Lord. And I believe God spoke this to my heart. And I'm going to obey the Lord this morning. You know, the Bible says that God will not share his glory with another. And he won't. But he says, give honor to whom honor is due. And there's a big difference in giving somebody glory and giving somebody honor. Glory is something that belongs to God and it's something that only God can do. God gets glory for the things that only God can do. But man gets honor and the Bible says they are worthy of double honor, those that labor. And today, I have a presentation that I want to make to Steve on this, the fourth anniversary of the Browns Revival. And this is not to say by any means that the revival is about to be over because we don't believe that. This is, last night was absolutely wonderful. I don't know if you were here last night or not, but last night was absolutely wonderful. And um, I want to say today that I look back on 1995 on Father's Day, and I've often thought about this. I wonder if there would have been another evangelist here that I didn't trust and didn't respect. I wonder what would have happened on that day, and I wonder how I would have reacted and responded. But Steve was somebody that I loved, respected, and trusted. And when the power of God came down on Father's Day in this place of 1995, I not only was willing because of him, but God mightily touched me in a way that I had never been touched before. And the Brownsville Revival broke out. God used a man. God found a man and used a man. And I want to tell you several things this morning that I would like to say about Steve is as I'm going to honor him today on the behalf of this church. I've never met another man in my life that has a burden and a vision and a passion for souls like he does. I've heard a lot of preaching in my time. My mother raised me in church. And I've heard a lot of preachers, ten evangelists. I've heard the best of evangelists. But I've never met another man or heard another man that had a passion and such a burning desire in his, in his soul to see the lost saved as I have Steve. And it's been the greatest privilege of mine over the last four years to be able to work with him and to get to know him even better and to see how God has took a young man in June of 1995, which was already a wonderful preacher. But I have seen with my own eyes God develop a preacher right before my very eyes. I've seen God take a man behind this pulpit that had a lot of zeal and a lot of enthusiasm, and I've seen God hone him and make a mighty preacher out of him. But I also have many other things to say about him, but one of the things I want to say about Steve is I appreciate him because he's a man of his word. I have found that to be true, and I haven't found that many men that I know, but Steve is a man of his word. If he tells you he's going to do something, before you can turn around, good, it's done. I appreciate his punctuality. He's always here an hour before service every night. And Steve is always here for revival. He feels such a responsibility and God has trusted him with that responsibility that he will not forfeit revival and 
leave it to someone else because he doesn't feel good or he's in a bad mood. But he comes on, and he's like an old Trojan horse, an old soldier. He's here night after night after night. And I have seen Steve come behind this pulpit that I knew when he stood behind this pulpit. Ten minutes before that, he was back in the bathroom back there throwing up in the commode. And I've seen him get right up here behind this pulpit and preach. And I sit there just thinking to myself, my God, how does he do it? And then up every morning at the break of day, sometimes before, getting sermon after sermon after sermon over four years of revival that has touched this world. And today, I want to make this presentation to Steve on the behalf, I think, of all of us here. And the Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due. And Steve, I want you to come join me. This says, presented to Stephen L. Hill for the completion of four years of continuing revival. Your passion for souls and diligence has brought the nations of the world to this church. The Brownsville Revival has witnessed hundreds of thousands of decisions for Christ. This church has hosted over three million visitors since Father's Day of 1995. Brownsville Assembly of God, June the 20th, 1999. Steve, we love you. You may be seated. There's one more recognition that I want to make this morning, and I want everybody to look this way and listen to me. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of people today that I could recognize, a lot of worthy people that I could recognize in, in a very high way. And if I would go past this person that I'm about to give this recognition to, there would be no stopping place if I would go past this with another plaque. Because you have people like Chaplain Robertson, you have people like Richard Crisco, and, and Steve Whitehead, the list just goes on and on and on. The worship team, the list is just endless of people that has paid a price and sacrificed to make sure that God has had a place to move and people that God could use. But one other person this morning that I wanted to give recognition to is um, Lyndall Cooley. Come on up, Lynn. <clears throat> yeah. Since the outbreak of revival on June of 1995, there's been another person that God has used, raised up before our very eyes and has used to touch the world through his music. And uh, don't do that, brother. <laughs> <laughs> We, we might have another Father's Day here. <laughs> but uh, God has used Lindell and has anointed him. <laughs> God has used Lindell and anointed him. And whenever God sent him to Brownsville, it was, it was uh, evidently and obviously the right choice for the right time. When God sent Steve here in 1995 for the outbreak of the Brownsville Revival, God not only had the messenger 
and the message ready for the world, but he had the music ready for the world. It's a God thing. There's no way to look at it otherwise. It is strictly a God thing. And Lendl, before you came here, God was blessing you, and it was obvious since you were a, a baby in your mother's womb that God had his hand and he was going to use you in this generation. But today I want to present this plaque to you on the behalf of all of us here at Brownsville Assembly. And what this plaque says, I put this on here, and because I, I think this says pretty well what all of us know. It says, your gifting as an anointed psalmist has been such a blessing not only to the Brownsville Revival, but to the entire body of Christ worldwide. Upon completion of this fourth year of continuing revival, we acknowledge that God has used you to change the sounds of worship across denominational lines, bringing millions closer to Jesus. Brownsville Assembly of God, June the 20th, 1999. Hallelujah. You may be seated just for, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> These, um, I was in, in Germany a few weeks ago with, with uh, Reinhardt, and um, I didn't know it was his 25th anniversary of his ministry and um, of, of worldwide ministry. And I've always honored that brother. And I told him, I said, you know, and and he came up to me, he said, he goes, he goes, well, I talked to him just the other day, he goes, brother, you don't understand. He said, we had 9,000 people there. He said, that never happens in Germany. 9,000 came out that night. And uh, it was just, it was an incredible meeting, not because I was there, because God was in the place. But I told him, I said, if I had known this, I would have done something special for you, like giving you a plaque. And he goes, plaques, plaques. He said, all you Americans do is give plaques. He said, he said, he said, we don't give plaques. I said, I'm going to get you a plaque. Plaques, plaques. So anyway, today we're having a plaque attack. Because I've got, um, I, I've, I've also, together in the Harvest Ministries, we went ahead and, um, and this was on my heart several weeks ago to do this and um, prepare something for pastor and something for the church. I, I, part of, you know, you're sort of funny about this because this revival is so alive right now. You know, it's like, you don't know where this thing is going. It's more alive now. More people are getting saved right now. The other night, Friday night, the new conversions were unbelievable. I almost got tired of people bringing me all these new converts to pray for. You know, he just got saved tonight. He just got saved tonight. He just got saved tonight. She just got saved tonight. She just got saved tonight. And I'm going, where are you from? Pensacola. Where are you from? Ohio. Where are you from? And it was just, I'm going, God, this is four years later. Jesus, what are you doing? What have you got planned? And so, you know, it's, um, but this is, this is an anniversary. This is, this is special. I remember, Pastor, when uh, we came, I came on, on Saturday and had dinner with, with Brenda. You remember that, Brenda, over at Red Lobster? And um, there was only one date open on our calendar for like two years, and that was Father's Day. That was the only day open. And we had talked, the only reason I came here to begin with to, was to get some money. So if anybody ever says, Steve Hill, is about money, it's true. I, he had promised me $5,000 when I was in Russia. He had, I called him from Russia, squalling and bawling. I needed some money and he always comes through. And so I, he had promised me back in 94 about $5,000. So I called him from Texas because the check had not arrived and I called him. <laughs> I called him to get the money. 
But we never talked about the money. We started talking about revival. And he said, Steve, why don't you come be with us? And I said, I don't have a date open. And I said, the only thing open is Father's Day. And no one has evangelists on Father's Day. And, and we went on and on and on. He said, come on and be with us Sunday night on Father's Day. So we came and we were at the restaurant. And, um, and Brenda and Pastor were talking to me. They said, you know, Pastor's tired. His mother, he's still grieving over the death of his mother. And it's just a difficult time right now. It's been, that was a rough week too, wasn't it? A rough week. And he said, would you preach tomorrow morning? And I felt so bad about that. Because no one, you don't preach on Father's Day morning as a, an evangelist. You just, that's the pastor's time. And if you were there that day, Pastor comes up to me that morning. I'll never forget this. And I was so honored, you know, to be here. You know, I'm thinking, man, I'm going to sit next to Pastor, you know, John Kilpatrick on Father's Day. You know, this is Brownsville. You know, this is, this is so cool. So he comes up to me and he goes, <clears throat> Brother Steve, would you mind sitting out in the congregation? I go, what a slime. You know, I'm going, <laughs> you know. Here's a big opportunity for me, and he makes me sit, and he made me sit right out there, and he said, I'll call on you when it's time. <laughs> you know, part of the glory of being a visiting evangelist is that hot shot seat right there, you know, you're just, you know, you're sitting next to the pastor. And anyway, I thought, man, hello. <laughs> and I, but he makes me sit out there because he knew the, he said, he knew the congregation would be ticked if they saw another man sitting up there, you know, rather than, and they'd know, oh, he ain't going to preach, and he's got somebody else. So he thought he was just going to pull it on you, you know. <laughs> but I've always loved this man. I, this pastor, we go, we go way back, and everything we've ever done together has been spiritual. I mean, it's always... It's always been so spiritual. I would call him from Argentina and we'd be talking about the, the healings and the signs and the wonders. And oftentimes up front, he would say, how much do you need, Steve? You know, he knew that I'm not calling him to ask him how he is. <laughs> he always knew I needed money and he would always give the money up front. And Rose, where are you at, Rose? You here today? If she, Rose, if you're here, she would always let me get through to you. And that was something, friend, missionaries, I don't care if it's just a 100-member church, as soon as they knew it was a missionary, they would say, the pastor's, you know, the pastor would go, no, 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 no. And he'd run and go into the bathroom. And the secretary would say, he's not in his office at this time. As soon as they knew it was a missionary. Because missionaries want one thing, friend. That was it. So he always blessed us, but we always talked about souls. And I remember coming up here, Pastor, one, uh, one, it was just, I think I was just driving through town, and we sat there, we talked about the demon-possessed. Do you remember that in your office? How casting out devils and demons. I mean, we just, oh, it was awesome. And it was not a surprise to me. It was not a surprise when I came two years before Father's Day, 95, I came to this church to speak on a Sunday night, and I was in the back pastor's lounge waiting on you your car pulled up and it was just a few minutes before the service and I wanted to go over what I was going to speak on and you walked in and the first thing you said to me was Steve I don't want you to preach we pray on Sundays for a revival and he said I just want you to say a few things about revival and then we're going to pray and he said here's money up front <laughs> and he did he gave me he gave me the money right up front, you know, to pacify me. And so um, <laughs> we're always building churches, and we always needed the finances. But um, then I came out here, and sure enough, there was, a, there was a holy awe in this place. And I shared for a few minutes, and then the church went into prayer. And I'll never forget a young boy. And I, got, I wrote it in my journal, still got that journal. A young boy came forward and was weeping his eyes out. He couldn't have been eight years old, 10 years old, squalling and bawling. And I listened to him and he was going, Jesus, save my daddy, save my daddy. And it wasn't one of these, you know, simple little prayers. He was passionate. And the whole church was like that. And I wrote in my journal that this is a place. If it happens anywhere, it's going to happen at Brownsville. 
not knowing anything about what might happen down the road. And two years later, and it wasn't, I, I, I just believe I was in the right place at the right time because it's a, it's a combination of a lot of people, a lot of ingredients, a lot of prayer. When I saw that picture this morning of those men standing around that clapboard church across the street, and I saw R.L. Berry, you know, and I saw all these men back in 1951, and I went, that's the reason there's revival in this church. That's the reason there's revival. Brother Hiram said to me, he's in that picture. He said to me, we didn't have no parking. Little did they know that they were going to own <laughs> all those houses that were all around them. That was all going to be parking. Pastor said a few minutes ago, and I'm going I'm to move right on, but he, he, he said a few minutes ago that there's no stopping on giving recognition. And, you know, Richard Crisco, Mike Brown, I asked him a few minutes ago, Mike, when was the school birthed? You know, when was the founding of the school? And he said it was founded in my heart on Father's Day, 1996. Isn't that correct? And I'm going, man, I wish I'd prepared something for that. And it's just, there's just no end. I'd love to give a Charlie plaque. And a... And the, you know, the oldest revival attendee, who's 101, she's here today, and, and the youngest, and it, it's just, it goes on and on and on. And I told Mike, I want to do something special for that school. You got a three-year anniversary coming up in January. But right now, uh, I want Pastor John Kilpatrick to come up here. Charlie, bring that out. Of course, his plaque is bigger than my plaque. Come on out here, brother. Yeah, it's a bigger plaque. It's, you know, we evangelists, we always have to outdo the pastors. But you're older than me. <laughs> this is, uh, says, presented to Reverend John Kilpatrick, Pastor Brownsville Assembly of God, Pensacola, Florida. Upon completion of four years of continuous revival, your godly leadership parallels the characteristics of history's great revivalists. They were serious about the great work of the ministry. They were bent upon success. They were men of faith. They were men of labor. They were men of patience. They were men of boldness and determination. They were men of prayer. They were men of decided doctrine. They were men of solemn conduct. They were men of deep spirituality of soul. Thank you for setting your sails to the wind, for standing strong in the midst of the storm, and for being used of God to bring hundreds safely to the shore of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord, Evangelist Stephen Hill, together in the Harvest Ministries, Father's Day, June 20th, 1999. Bless him, Jesus. Bless him. Bless him, Jesus. Bless him, Jesus. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Just one more, and I'm going to get out of here and give this back to Pastor, and it's up to him to close this thing. I don't know how you close a service like this. Your plaque's bigger than my plaque. Your plaque's bigger than mine. Plaques, plaques, plaques. That's all you Americans do is give plaques. I'll never, that was such a classic statement from Bonky. <laughs> but I want to give something to the church. Yesterday um, at the revival, I was walking down the hallway coming in, and this girl walks up. And I took a look at her, and she's like this tall now. And I looked straight into her eyes, and I remember she was one of the ones that was in the fire circle. But at the beginning of the revival, we used to circle these kids. We'd get around in a circle, and they would come up to me every night. Remember those, Pastor? Every night. This was like in June and July of 1995. And they would say, can we do the circle? Can we do the circle? Can we do the circle? And they'd gather all their friends in this big circle. We'd do it right here. Gather all their friends in this big circle. And I'd go, you ready? they go, and we'd go, fire! 
and they'd just be all hit by the power of God, be thrown everywhere. It was, it was so dangerous. <laughs> that was before the lawyer stepped in and said, you better watch it. <laughs> but the fire would come down. I mean, they were hit by the power of God. And, and um, I walked up to this girl last night. Now she's not this tall. She's this tall. You know, she like 14, 15 years old now. And, and I went, you were in the fire circle. She goes, oh, yeah, and the fire's still falling. <laughs> Glory. It is so powerful. Anyway, right now, I want to um, just present something to Brownsville. It's just a token. That's all it is. There's, um, you know, there's really, the, we can show our little appreciation here, but there's, um, there's rewards going to be handed out in heaven. And I got a feeling, um, you know, recognition is going to, it's going to be surprising to all of us. I believe there's going to be saints that we know not of that are going to be called before the throne. And God's going to say, Agnes, Agnes, come on up here. And Agnes is going to come up and he's going to say, it was because of your prayers in 1927, you laid hands on the community of Brownsville. You walked the streets in 1927 and prayed that one day, a church would be planted there. Agnes, you sought God for 12 years. You sought me for 12 years. And then you died before the church was ever born. Agnes, here's your crown. I just got a feeling God's going to be like that. I do. But I just want to give something to the church right now. Charlie, if you'd bring that out. It's a little unusual. It's a little different. It's not a plaque. It is a <laughs> plaques, plaques, plaques. This is a... Um, it's a sack, <laughs> sacks, sacks. No, it's a, um, it's an eagle. And it says, um, presented to Brownsville Assembly of God, a church that soared like an eagle through four years of continuous, I made sure I put continuous there, friend, because this thing ain't over. A church that soared like an eagle through four years of continuous revival. Thank you for hosting over 3.5 million visitors from 120 nations. May the blessing of Jesus Christ be upon you. Together in the Harvest Stephen Hill Evangelist, Father's Day, June 20th, 1999. God bless you, Brownsville. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor, come on up. You're the federal headship. Mm. Bless you. Thank you, Steve. Isn't that beautiful? <clears throat> Would you stand with me, please? Hallelujah. I'm going to hold this. I want to encourage you before we leave today. Do you believe in your heart that God is about to do something powerful and special here? I want to encourage you today to continue to stand with us in the gap. Continue to support us. We need your support, your presence, your bodily presence at these revival services. We need you here, especially on Thursday nights for the prayer time. That time is so important for what God has done and what he is going to do and what he's presently doing. We need your presence at these prayer meetings. Don't forget the school has their services on Wednesday evening. Mike, before we leave today, I'm going to have you come and address everybody just for a minute. And I'm going to let you express your heart today because he leaned over a moment ago and shared something with me that uh, I think would be good for him to share before we dismiss. But uh, I wanted to say this too today in the third anniversary. But whenever God decided to pour out his spirit in this church, he knew that a school was going to be coming from this church. And what better person to fit in that slot as the president of the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry than Dr. Michael Brown. <laughs> Mike, we love you. You know, wherever we go around the world and we boast about what the Lord has done and we give glory to the Lord, the one thing that we can never 
fully explain when people ask, well, explain this one entity. How do you get a whole church community behind what God is doing? And how do you get that heart of service? And how do you get people pouring themselves out? And I said, that's, that's the most challenging thing of all. And we fully understand the degree that this is a team effort. I want you to understand that right now, as we speak, there are people who were transformed in this revival that are now graduates of the school, that are now reaching the lost in other parts of the world right now as we speak serving as full-time missionaries and workers right at this very moment lives are being touched tens of thousands of miles from here and jesus is extending his kingdom i, I just want to read one thing to you be, because i i'm sure that the best is yet to come i'm sure of it hear me if we will simply go after God and seek him as we have never sought him before, if we will simply go to the basics and give ourselves to prayer and fasting and pressing in and crying out and believing him and taking hold of his word, the dreams, the promises, the things that have burned in us for years, they're about to be fulfilled. You say, how can you be so sure? Listen, for years and years, something has been in my heart. I've known it. It's, it's been real to me that I'd be right in the thick of revival in America. I knew it. When God started moving through different people in different places, I rejoiced and said, Lord, so be it, your will be done. Maybe I was wrong, but this deep thing, I'd be right in the middle of training leaders and touching people, and then this breaks out and God graciously allows me to be part of this. And for years, there's been something burning in me. I never put the two together. And I'm not saying this for me, I'm saying this because it's wider, please hear me. It's been burning in me for years that I'd be right in the middle of raising up a school that would have an impact on an entire generation. And, and here we are in a setting, by the grace of God, we'll go to 12 or 1,500 full-time students in this fall. I mean, this is extraordinary. That's happening. But just as surely as those things have burned in me, and now we're in the early stages of seeing it fulfilled, it's burned in me that we will see impossible miracles right in front of our eyes, that we will see whole communities shaken, that we will see things that will boggle our minds. It's burned in me. And if the first has happened and the second has happened, then the third and the fourth and the fifth will happen. And more than that, one night when Linda was leading worship, some months and months ago we were doing i got a feeling everything's going to be all right and then he said for the theologians here we'll change the words i've got a promise everything's going to be all right friends we have promises from god that have not yet been fulfilled and if we'll hold them to his word we'll see the glory come down we'll see the community shaken we'll see jesus exalted we'll see the impossible become normal for the glory of god just this last thing, we are praying with you for the community. We are, we are believing with you at the school. Bob Gladstone and I have been in conversation about, by the fall, having instituted, we're going to be talking to others in prayer ministry in the school, having 24 hours a day, seven days a week, continual prayer and continual worship, not even at the same place at the same time, but both going on simultaneously, twin tracks. And one of the key things, as we have our all-night prayer meetings at the school from midnight to five, one of the key things God has called us to do is to be praying for the community. We cry out to God, and we're going to be raising up more and more teams for evangelism. We're doing it regularly still right through the summer, but by the grace of God, we're going to have hundreds of young evangelists out all over the streets of this community and working door to door every way that we can to see Pensacola shaken for the glory of God. God wants to do it. Let me just read this one thing. It's the Holy Father. Actually, pastor's gone, but I was going to present him with a book. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> I, I just want you to have this picture. It was on my heart, and somehow I thought I was supposed to read it today. I didn't know that pastor would ask me to, to just say a few words and then to, to bless you before you go. But I wrote this six months before the revival broke here, believing, feeling sure that we were on the verge of going from renewal to revival in America, and that something was about to break. And I wrote this, once while preaching near Buffalo, I visited Niagara Falls together with Jennifer, our older daughter. 
As we walked along the bank toward the falls, there was a clear, strong tide pulling the waters along. The thought struck me, that is the state of a growing church. It is progressing and moving forward, but that is not revival. Then we got nearer to the falls. The flowing stream had turned into raging rapids. The water was capped with white waves and the tide was almost violent in its pull. Again, the thought came to mind. That is what most of us today call revival. It's a great increase over the normal state of things, but much more is happening and it looks really exciting, but it's still not revival. Then we came to the falls. They were absolutely awesome. I had seen them as a little boy, but the reality was so much more powerful than the memory. They were not just grand and impressive, they were staggering. But I wasn't content just to see the falls, I wanted to experience them. So Jennifer and I joined a group of other interested tourists, rented out some big yellow raincoats, left our shoes in a locker, and went down to the rocks at the base of the falls. The closer we got, the more overwhelming it became. Torrents of water. So much water crashed like thunder. In a moment we were soaked. The wind, where did it all come from? Blew so hard it actually took our breath away. We were no longer spectators. We were participants, caught up in the pounding, swirling, churning, flooding display of natural glory. There in face-to-face -face encounter with the raw power of God, with the majesty of the Creator exploding all around me, I could only raise my hands and praise Him who lives forever and ever. I was swallowed up in the falls. That is a picture of revival. Are you ready? Father, we're ready. We're ready. Turn it up. Pour it out. Take us deeper. Oh, God, may these be the former years. May these be the early years. May these be the beginning years. May the years of the radical, impossible outpouring that boggles our minds be released now. Take us in over our heads. Jesus. Just keep your hands raised. I want to bless you. I want to bless you. I want to pronounce these words. I've never done this in the congregation here. From Numbers, the sixth chapter, the priestly blessing. Let me say these words over you here in the Family Life Center. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yisa Adonai panavelecha, v'yasem lecha shalom. The Lord lift his face upon you and grant you peace. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you.